My thanks to Nikki, who has been a great colleague and who has used her membership on the House Armed Services Committee to advance our cause. One of our victories last year was to get rid of that foolish don't ask, don't tell policy, and Nikki was a and, um, I know we have, I, I think we have some students here, and I'm glad that we do. Um, I'm getting ready, because I probably do some part-time teaching. I'm gonna start assigning papers now. <laughs> what we need, or particularly for some young LGBT students of others, to take a look at the arguments that have been used every time we have tried to achieve our rights by the people who are against us. And you know the rights, they always are. Oh, I don't have anything against those people. But if we let them do X or Y or Z, it will be terribly disruptive. And every time they make the same arguments, and every time they're not true. And what happens is they get away with having made all these predictions of doom and gloom, and not enough is done to document them. Now, we've all seen that with marriage. We're gonna, we are seeing it now with don't ask, don't tell. So I urge some people, go back and read the ludicrous arguments that were made against our making progress in that area as well as others, and then document how falsely they were done. Nikki has also used her membership to try to protect women in the armed services against sexual mistreatment, because I raised the question of don't ask, don't tell. And let's, look, the people opposing the right of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people to serve their country in the military argue that if that happened, it might lead to patterns of sexual abuse. Well, let's be very clear. We have to admit the truth. There are examples of sexual abuse in the U.S. military. They are overwhelmingly heterosexual males abusing women. And that is something that predated us and it said we may follow us, and people like Nikki are fighting against it. I also want to mention, while I'm here, my colleague Dave Cicilline, who's joined us. Um, the uh, Republicans will be making a fight. I, I ask you now, as a personal favor, to make sure that David is reelected. There are four of us who are openly gay, three gay and one lesbian in the House right now. Two of us are leaving. Tammy Baldwin, I hope, to win the U.S. Senate seat. Me to be able to live like a person. And um, that's going to leave two, but let's sure make sure it's not one. So do me a favor, assuage my guilt at leaving by making sure that David Cicilline stays in the House of Representatives. <laughs> and to the Fenway Community Health Center, I want to express my very deep appreciation on a several counts. First of all, let us not forget the pioneering work this organization did when this country was to too great an extent paralyzed by AIDS, terrified by AIDS, and the work that this group did to show that this was simply an illness that had to be confronted with all that science could bring to bear was a very important example to the rest of the country and a service delivery. And it continues to be a great example of service delivery, which is important both for the medical services that are provided, for the education that's provided, and for giving America a model of how we can do health care in an efficient way that's also a fair way. The notion that we have to save money and stop, we, the notion that we have to reduce the federal deficit by cutting back on medical care that's available to people of limited income, in part so we can continue to waste more money in Afghanistan and in Western Europe and elsewhere militarily on things we don't need, is outrageous, but one of the things that we have here is we can point to the Fenway Community Health Center as an example of how you can do it right, how you can do it in a way that makes a great deal of sense. And I'm also very appreciative to Nikki, but not surprised. By the way, Nikki, you may have noted that she was particularly uh, appropriately respectful about the role that Jim Reddy, my partner, plays, because the roles that spouses play is a very tough one, of course, that's exemplified by Dean Harra as well. Uh, and uh, Nikki comes by that through her own experience, uh, and well, she didn't mention, let me point out that Nikki's then husband, Paul Saunders, one of the great statesmen of our time, 
was the first United States senator in American history to file the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Paul Sangas was there in 1979 and continued to be a strong supporter. I'm not going to talk a great deal because people say, well, you shouldn't preach to the converted. You, you don't want to take that too far. If you could not preach to the converted, there would be a lot of unemployed clergy in America because that's, that's what they do. Um, but it is important for us to look at how bad things were legally and socially and economically for those of us who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and how much progress we've made. Now, I say at the beginning, I don't talk about the progress because I expect people to be grateful. The fact that there is less of a hateful prejudice than there used to be is no reason to be grateful. I, I don't want to get into a theological debate. Um, if I did, I'd probably run for the Republican nomination for president, which is what, <laughs> what that appears to be. And let me just say, as an aside, and I, I am going to have to talk a little partisan, but I do want to make one, I think, fairly non-controversial statement. No political process in which Rick Santorum is taken seriously has any right to respect. But I am always puzzled when something terrible happens and fewer people die as a result of something terrible than you might have guessed in the worst case and people express their thanks to God because only eight people died. Um, yeah, but it happened. I don't know, was God off duty when it happened? I'm not sure, but uh, in a similar vein, uh, there never should have been this kind of prejudice. Life shouldn't have been blighted. So um, I don't say, I don't talk about the progress, as I said, to elicit gratitude. Uh, the model here is George Orwell, the great writer, who was shot in the neck during the Spanish Civil War. And he recovered, and someone said to him, well, George, you're pretty lucky. You were shot in the neck and you recovered. He said, well, I think all the people who were never shot in the neck in the first place are even luckier. Um, <laughs> the reason for talking about the prejudice is to figure out how we did it. And I know there have been some debates in our community about it. Let me be very clear how I think we did it. We did it in two ways. First of all, by being honest about who we are. Um, now, as you know, there's a kind of discrimination in that. Uh, and there are people who say, well, I mean, older people, people my age and close to it, remember when we were told, well, it's, it's okay that you're gay. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> but why do you have to talk about it? Um, well, the fact is that those of us who are LGBT, we don't uh, discuss our sexuality more than anybody else. The fact is that Gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender people and heterosexual people both discuss their sexuality all the time. The difference is that when they, we do it, it's called coming out. When they do it, it's called talking. <laughs> Find me anybody you know who does not, in the course of the day, in the course of conversation, discuss his or her sexuality five or seven or 13 times, particularly if they're heterosexual, they have even less reason to hide it than we did. So we did it by coming out, and then we did it by mobilizing politically. And the votes have worked, and the political process worked. Now, if we had remained a hated minority, or a minority that people were frightened of, it wouldn't have worked. But what's happened is two things. As we have been honest about who we are, and as the country has learned that we are their relatives and their co-workers and their employees and their teachers and their students and their doctors and their patients, prejudice literally is a prejudgment. It, it's a judgment based on ignorance. So our reality has defeated the prejudice. And as that has happened, we have sensibly mobilized to take political advantage of that. And we are winning. But the second caveat I have is the fact that we are winning this fight. And I, I'm very convinced we are winning. That is no reason to ease up. In fact, I think I'm not a great military historian. Um, we were allowed to read it. We just weren't allowed to serve in it. But um, 
The fact is that if you look at the great generals and the great military strategists, it is precisely when you are leading, when you are winning the battle, that you crack down. It is precisely when you are on the verge of victory that you do everything you can to wipe things up and not leave a remnant to go after you. And we have to do that in a couple of ways. First of all, I, look, I wish that the rights of LGBT people were not partisan. I wish I could eat more and not gain weight. <laughs> I wish I had as much energy today as I had 40 years ago. But I have learned that acting on my wishes when they are unrealistic will get me in trouble. I wish our issues weren't partisan issues. I didn't make them partisan. When I started out in politics, there were Republicans who were very supportive of us. There ain't very many left. And they're being driven out of that party right, and right now, as you saw it with Olympia Snow. The fact is that the Republican Party has moved into more and more of an anti-LGBT direction. Now, I hope that won't remain the case, but the only way for that to happen is for bigotry to be defeated. And there is not an issue of our rights that I can think of, and I'm sorry if this, any, if I endanger your tax exemption, blame me, say you couldn't get me to stop. <laughs> but if Barack Obama is not reelected, we cannot expect to make progress in anything we want. Now, there are people who will say, well, yeah, but Obama, he didn't do this and he didn't do that. I think he's spending too much in the military. Um, I want the Justice Department to stop harassing people with smoking marijuana. Enormous waste of money. That's the issue. That's the issue me and Ron Paul work together on. So I will acknowledge to you that Barack Obama is not a perfect candidate. And I'll tell you something else. I had a, a, an experience that uh, Senator Chang Diaz, Representative Malia, the counselors who were here, uh, O'Malley and Consalvo and, and, and Connolly had, and Presley, um, uh, the Nikki had, and Dave Cicilline. I had an experience some of you probably never had. I once voted for a candidate who I knew was absolutely perfect. By the time I ran for re-election, that wasn't true anymore. <laughs> because after a couple of years, I knew I'd made a compromise here, I'd done a little this there, but I did the best I could. So when I ran for re-election, I knew I wasn't perfect, but I worked very hard for me anyway. That's all I ask. Yes, there are reasons for us to want to move Barack Obama, but his getting re-elected is a necessary condition for our making any progress whatsoever on our issues. It is not a sufficient condition, and you do both. And if you're wondering, again, you get to the... Between now and November, this is the choice we have. As soon as the election's over, I hope he gets reelected, and I hope we all start harassing him again to do more than he's done in a whole range of areas. And as you go forward, I ask you to remember the words of a great 20th century philosopher that many people here will not have heard of. Some of the people, again, my age will have. His name was Henny Youngman. <laughs> he was actually a great comedian. And he, uh, as the comedians did in the 40s, 50s, into the 60s, they made a lot of mother-in-law jokes and wife jokes. They were all men. They, they made those jokes. Uh, they, they're adaptable to same sex, though, so it's okay. Because, and, but the, the, one of the funniest things any young man ever said, and the most profound, was, how's your wife compared to what? <laughs> That's, by the way, what has been my question every time I get an issue before me. Compared to what? If I don't do this, then what do I do? So, we need to work on that. We need to do that to complete marriage equality. We have a Supreme Court case coming about the Defense of Marriage Act that will be very important for a lot of people here. It was brought by, by far one of our greatest assets and the best lawyer in the field, Mary Bonato, who is a brilliant and thoughtful scholar. And by the way, if it weren't for the first and fourth and fifth and some other amendments, I would pass a law that said no one can bring a lawsuit on behalf of LGBT issues unless Mary says okay. <laughs> because she is a superb lawyer and a brilliant political strategist, and please listen to her, and she's doing it right. We are one justice away from the Defense of Marriage Act, I believe, being declared unconstitutional. Maybe yes, maybe no, but I'll tell you this. If 
Barack Obama loses to a Mitt Romney or a Rick Santorum or a Newt Gingrich or God knows what else, then our chances of winning that will be very, very slender. And that is true on issue after issue. Because we're close to completing what we need to do for formal legal equality. There'll still be prejudice in this society. And let me be clear, we have repealed don't ask, don't tell, and we won the hate crimes issue. And by the way, when I talk about David and the importance of reelecting him, now we have enormously strong allies, and we couldn't win anything without allies. There aren't enough of us. Liz can work very hard in the House, and she does, but she needs the support of others. Sonia is one of those who supports us. We need to have these alliances, but it's also important to have some of us who can make it personal, because in legislatures, making it personal is important. And I'll give you the one example. When we were debating the hate crimes bill a few years ago, and some of my colleagues were being told by ministers in their districts that they couldn't vote for the hate crimes bill because then that minister could not preach that homosexuality is uh, disfavored in the Bible. And it is true, there are passages in Leviticus which say a man should not lie with man and the man also shouldn't eat a lobster. So, I mean, that's what it says. So if you don't want to eat lobster, uh, maybe you can then begin to talk to me about this. Until then, uh, I'm still not going to go with you. But um, they argued that if hate crimes law passed, their free speech would be restricted. Now, that's obvious nonsense. We couldn't restrict speech if we wanted to. The hate crimes bill simply said that if you commit violence against someone, if you destroy someone's property, and your motive is bigotry, then there's an extra sentence. But nothing happens until you have first committed a physical crime. And I wanted to get that across to people, and I thought the best way to do it, it was a Democratic caucus. I had just become chairman of the Financial Services Committee. Um, I found that I had a lot of new friends in the financial community. It was very interesting. I didn't have to read Dale Carnegie. I made a lot of new friends without getting any nicer. It was a very interesting <laughs> phenomenon. But I said, I want to be very clear, if this bill passes, it will still be legal to call me a fag. I just wouldn't recommend it if you were in the banking business. <laughs> there, is a, there is a dimension that we bring. And look, our marriage is not political. It is deeply personal and a wonderful event for me. But I did do one thing, and Jim and I agreed. We are going to get married while I'm still a member of the House of Representatives, because I think <laughs> There are, and members of Congress in general have been very gracious, but Nikki and David can join in, and you can think of the people in the cases of which I am looking forward to saying, oh, hi, I think you've met my husband. And there will be members of Congress that I look forward to saying that to. But we've gotten hate crimes, and the hate crimes bill, by the way, is fully transgender inclusive. And in fact, hate crimes, sadly, transgender individuals are more likely to be victims of hate crimes. So that's part of the hate crime statute and always has been. We have two down and two to go. We have, and, uh, and we have domestic, uh, and, and getting rid of DOMA. If we get rid of DOMA, that will take care of immigration and tax fairness and a lot of other things. Um, I mention that because uh, four years ago, and I, I talk about the partisanship. I'm going to wind this up, but I, I want to make one other important point about partisanship. In 2006, when it looked like we, the Democrats, might be able to take the House back, the Republicans appealed sadly to prejudice. That was the beginning of an evolution which is wound up in this bizarre exhibition we have today. Um, and uh, I mean the Republican primaries. And um, <laughs> a Republican congressman from Indiana did an ad in which he said that, uh, well, first of all, they put out a letter, a number of, one of the Republican committees put out a letter that said, if you let Nancy Pelosi become speaker, the chairman of the committees will be Barney Frank, Charlie Rangel, and John Conyers. Charlie and John, Charlie and John are, of course, leading African Americans. John from Detroit, judiciary, Charlie from Ways and Means. So I showed that to Charlie Rangel and said, if you elect the Democrats, the chairman will be Barney Frank, John Conyers, and Charlie Rangel. Charlie looked at me and said, huh, I didn't realize you were colored. Um, <laughs> but this guy from Indiana said that if we won, Nancy was going to allow me to enact the radical homosexual agenda. I'm pleased to report 
he lost his election by a very large majority. And the next day, I was speaking to the Boston Chamber of Commerce, which is a very good group of people and sensible, and many of them totally supportive of us, unlike the very right-wing National Chamber of Commerce. And I said I felt inadequate, because here was this man in Indiana uh, who said I was going to bring the radical homosexual agenda, and he lost badly. He actually lost by a lot. Of, there was apparently a congressional district in Indiana that was waiting for me to bring forward the radical homosexual agenda. <laughs> and my embarrassment was that I didn't have one. I was going to have to disappoint those good people. I said, no, it, it is true. There are things I am pushing for. I particularly would like us to be able to get married, get a job, and join the Army. But I have to say to you, by what historical standard is that a radical agenda? I mean, can you think of a radical in American history whose platform was get married, go to work, and join the military? We had a pretty bourgeois agenda. We're on the verge of accomplishing it, but we will win that fight only if we make ourselves active politically. And here's my, my last point. If you have people who tell you they are your friend, talk about straight people, and they respect you and support your rights, if they don't get out and vote in the first place, and if you don't get out and vote, you're making a terrible mistake. Secondly, because our vote, our, we have now got a majority. We are poised, I think, to win formal legal equality in most of this country within 10 years. There'll be a few states, I'm afraid, where you won't yet be able to get married. Um, they are not states in which I would choose to live, but, <laughs> but the people who live there, the people who live there have the right to it. But we can win this thing now if people get active and engaged politically. So when people say, oh, it doesn't make any difference who wins, well, it may not make any difference if you don't care about our right to marry or protecting all of us against employment discrimination. And yeah, in many parts of the country, we are protected against employment discrimination. I understand, by the way, we had some controversy over the uh, fullness of ENDA. Um, for those of us who wondered why, when we did this in 2007, we weren't fully inclusive, look at the fight we had here in Massachusetts to get transgender inclusion. And I got to tell you, if something is hard to do in Massachusetts and New York, adding South Carolina, Nebraska, and Utah doesn't make it easier. That's the forum I work in. But we are now at the point where, and I got to be partisan again, the next time we have a Democratic president, House, and Senate, I believe we will be able to get a fully inclusive ender. We didn't have the votes for it in 2007 because, and I went through this, when I first started filing uh, gay and lesbian legislation in uh, 1972, I ran into people, I encountered a lot of people who just, the whole idea made them uneasy. They didn't know about us. Well, we spent a lot of time educating them. The process of educating people about transgender people has begun later, but we're at that point now. I think we're ready to win. We have, we've been trying. We are ready to do that. But only if people get out there and vote. So you got to get out there and vote. And secondly, and here's the deal. I remember, again, people my age, when 30 years ago, people would brag about the fact that having told their parents that they were gay, they weren't thrown out of the house. Yeah, big deal, but you know, it was a big deal back then. We are beyond acceptance. There was a period, given the prejudice in the society, when acceptance was a game. They can shove acceptance. We now need to demand respect. And what I urge everybody to do is this. There will be an election which will be enormously important to us. Um, I saw Mitt Romney bragging about the fact that when he was governor, he kept Massachusetts from being the Las Vegas of gay marriage, <laughs> denigrating, having done everything he could legally to block our right to marry, he then denigrates it for cheap political advantage. And I also remember in 2004, and to a certain extent in 2006, I spent most of my time campaigning with mass equality, trying to save people, almost all Democrats, who would voted not to put our rights on the ballot and who Romney was trying to defeat, but that is one of the explicit reasons. So this election will have a lot to do with our rights. There will also be referenda in several states, and there'll be the New Hampshire override vote where people are going to try to uphold John Lynch, and that's a, there's a fighting chance in the New Hampshire legislature. Between now and November, if you care about our rights, if you have any self-respect, and by the way, many of us are in a position where it won't make much difference. 
Jimmy and I are kind of beyond that for a lot of reasons. I lucked out. I got to be a big shot. So all kinds of people wanted to be nice to me who I don't, they probably didn't like me. Who cared? Because I don't have to deal with them anymore. But, you know, as I've said on the floor of the House, I understand that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in an important position right now. But as I said on the floor of the House, I used to be 15. I remembered what it was like to be 15 and to be terrified that my parents, people who loved me, wonderful, decent people, were going to find out who I really was. I remember the terrors that we had. I remember, and, and, and I kept it quiet, so I escaped some of the uh, torments. Others are still facing it. Those of us who have managed by a combination of luck and skill, and remember there's luck in everything in it, but by a combination of luck and skill, we've surmounted the prejudice in our own lives. But how dare anybody who has been through that forget about those 15-year-olds who are still out there who need us. And so what we have to do, drawing on our experience, is to say to all of our friends and our relatives and our coworkers and everybody else, you tell me you care about me, you tell me you love me, you like me, you respect me. If that's the case, then you have to vote to vindicate my rights. Because voting for people who will denigrate me and treat me as a second-class citizen and inflict misery on other people who are vulnerable just because they're like me, that is wholly inconsistent with any profession of uh, respect and affection for me. We have got to be the troops. Those of us, again, who are able to come to a dinner like this, who are able to make this, we've got a constituency out there of frightened young people and maybe some older people in some states where things are still a problem. We have the opportunity now, and I believe the moral obligation, to finish up this fight. So I am delighted to have a chance, yeah, preaching to the converted, but while you're converted, you may not be energetic enough. So if I can add a little energy to the converts, let me say this. It's not enough for you to be converted. I want you to be, and there aren't a lot of contexts in which I'll say this, but I need you to be missionaries, not just converts. Let's get out there and make sure we win this fight. Thank you.